Hi, Charles. Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. Morning, Len. The research day. So let me first introduce um, my co-organizers of uh, this research day. By the way, I am Joyce Ngombelo and um, Kara, do you wanna show up your face there? <laughs> Kara Jordan. So another. You're muted, Kara. I'm here, just on another page, probably from what you're looking at. <laughs> okay, and then Josh, Josh Marco is um, co-organizer of this research day. Good morning. Thank you. So um, if you are new to today, we welcome you and we hope that you will continue to join us uh, for the other math education for, forum that we, for us, that we do. Um, we have um, every month beginning of September to April, um, the last Saturday of the month. You are welcome to contact us and to check us on our website. And if you have any idea that you would like us to be to discuss in one of the forum, please do so. So welcome again. And um, so at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Charles to uh, tell us, you know, how the program is going to look like today, and then we'll start with our program. Excellent. Thanks, Joyce. Um, so just a quick uh, set of ground rules. So we do have uh, the, the sessions, the, the main sessions recorded uh, today. We will also have the, um, uh, some of the research reports recorded during the day. Uh, just, so just to, as a heads up, um, we do encourage um, participants to leave, uh, particularly in the, um, uh, in the uh, breakout rooms, to leave your microphone on mute if you're not talking, just to minimize some of the background noise that might uh, come up. But definitely um, uh, in the discussion, in, in the poster uh, sessions, um, definitely we'll, we'll want to be opening that up. Um, you can also feel free to keep your video off unless you're sharing, uh, uh, but we de definitely are happy to see everyone who's, uh, who's here today. Um, as usual, we always encourage respectful discourse and a positive collegial atmosphere. So if there are any reports from the various um, math ed organizations here in Canada, uh, whether that be OAME, OMCA, OCMA, uh, CMESG, CMS, CME, or MCAN, or FAMO, uh, or others, uh, feel free to post uh, the update within the chat uh, so that um, folks in the community can, can learn about uh, what's going on. Uh, and uh, while, uh, while uh, that's happening, just want to give a quick overview of the day. Uh, so we're going to be starting off, or we're starting off right now with just a quick welcome. Uh, but our, our first speaker is going to be Alf Coles, uh, who will be uh, getting started in just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, we will also, that will be followed by another uh, talk from Nick Lasserman uh, from Columbia University. Uh, and then at 11.25, we'll be having, uh, we'll be going out into breakout sessions uh, into three different breakout rooms uh, for the research reports. Um, that'll be followed uh, after about half an hour by the poster gallery in short oral. Uh, and that's actually gonna be a fairly rapid fire session as well. <clears throat> There'll be seven breakout rooms to choose from there. Uh, so if you don't have access to the agenda, we'll post the link in the chat so you can take a quick look uh, and see maybe what you'll be interested, but we'll also be having some of those details up on the screen uh, when we get to that. Uh, so we'll have uh, the posters in breakout rooms number one to five and the short orals in breakout rooms six and seven. Uh, so you'll just have to take a look and see which one you wanna join. Uh, and if you're having any difficulty getting into the rooms, uh, you can just drop a message uh, in the chat to, to myself and I'll help you get in there. Um, so following the poster gallery and short orals, we'll be uh, continuing uh, back into the breakout rooms uh, for the research reports. Uh, so we'll all come back and then go back uh, for those research reports. Uh, and we'll be ending the, the forum today uh, with about half an hour debrief and discussion. 
So I'll ha hand it over to Kara to get us started with our first speaker. Unmute myself, here we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Al Colt. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon in Bristol. Um, I did a little bit of my research and I, I was able to come across your most recent TEDx talk in December. And I'd like to steal a quote from uh, Caleb Gatengo that you used in that we need to stop teaching in a way that doesn't reach people to learn. And I think that says a lot about what we might be expecting. Um, but I also would like to throw in a little blurb for your Worldwide University Network project that you're leading on, um, getting real change at the global level for mathematics education. Um, I think I saw Natalie Sinclair in that group there in the photos, um, which we're all familiar with as well. So I'm very excited to hear you talk today. Um, thanks for joining us, Al. Thank you, Kara, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I wonder, I would really like some interaction on the chat during this talk, and I'd really encourage people to um, post questions, and maybe, Kara, if there's a question, you feel free to interrupt me and say that. I'm, I might even have a pause. And just to get you all going on that, I wonder if you all would um, just write one word about how you're feeling in this moment now. Just post that in the chat. And while you're doing that, I will share my screen. Um, and Kara, maybe you could tell me, I, I'm not sure if the presenter view is gonna work here. So could you just tell me if I go on to presenter view, do you see my whole presenter view or are you seeing just the one slide? Well, you're on mute, sorry. We are reverberating. Um, I can see, yeah, the screen, but I can see all the all the slides at the bottom, and then there's a little blurb. And okay. now this is those slides are all along the left hand side, yeah, yeah. With the main one. Okay. That's fine. I'll I'll just do it like this. That's Here we fine. go. That's Great. the one slide. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Um, so I just want to have a look at the um, ah, it's a nice comments. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, I was thinking about the land acknowledgement, and I know it's uh, very important beginning of sessions in Canada, and it, it's not a, a tradition in England. Um, I'm actually speaking from Bath, uh, the city of Bath, which is outside Bristol. Um, there's a legend that Bath was started as a city about 3000 years ago. Um, and the legend is that it was started by the, the father of King Lear, the King Lear who was in the Shakespeare play, um, partly for its healing waters. Um, I guess we would say it was colonized by the Romans um, about 2000 years ago. Um, really the infrastructure they left was, 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 was not really improved on until about a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but what's famous now in Bath is the sort of Georgian architecture from the 18th century. Uh, and of course, well, not of course, but, but, but we, we are increasingly aware of how the money for that um, was, was really largely on the back of uh, money made in the West Indies uh, as a result of transatlantic slavery. Um, so I'm not quite sure how, how that's possible to, to, to acknowledge the, the, that, uh, yeah, words, words don't really feel like they're appropriate to, to, to acknowledge that context. I want to talk to you today about uh, something which is really very half formed for me um, and, and really probably quite naive. Uh, and so that's partly why I'd really welcome comments in the chat uh, and, and I'll make sure to leave 10 minutes at the end uh, for, for, for discussion and questions. Um, I want to also acknowledge uh, that these thoughts are, are not far from my own and uh, the thinking that has developed here is largely with Kate LaRue from the University of Cape Town, Amanda Solares, who works at the Sinvestav Institute in Mexico, Mark Boylan, Sheffield Hallam University in England, Richard Barwell, I'm sure many of you know in Ottawa, uh, and then colleagues at my own institution, University of Bristol, Tracy Halliwell and Julian Brown. I want to structure this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a perspective might be. Um, I want to offer some detail of a, of a project in, in Mexico that I'm involved in, um, then sort of zoom out a bit and have a few more general comments. And then if we've got time, have, have, have an, another one or two sort of classroom examples of, of what I'm talking about. Um, but if I think about uh, perspectives in mathematics education, uh, I guess these are the kind of lists that uh, I would come up with. And, and of course, there are many other names and, and, and many variations. 
And I suppose if I look at that list, one thing that's increasingly struck me is, is the absence of the non-human in there. Um, and I suppose a sense that, that we can bracket off a lot of the world. And I think that's quite appropriate actually in lots of situations. So, so, so I'm not saying that as, as a negative aspect of any of these perspectives. Um, it seems entirely correct to me that, that, that we've needed to think about issues like problem solving, sort of algebra fractions. And if I'm thinking about children learning algebra in a classroom, then it feels okay to me to, to, to bracket off what might be happening outside that classroom largely. And, 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 and a lot of these perspectives, of course, offer huge insights into what may, might be going on and, and their succession has alerted us to, to different aspects of, of what's going on uh, in a classroom and with, with, with learners. But I suppose I was alerted to this quotation by Kate LaRue uh, and this felt to me quite, it hit me quite hard. So I suppose I, I want to put an eye in there. Am I not like those mechanical toys that endlessly make the same gesture when everything else has changed around them? I, I've increasingly been feeling that, that my work in mass education is kind of going on as though, you know, in, 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 in the absence of, of recognition of, of just how much is changing uh, in the world. And so I suppose the question I want to play around with and, and work with today is, what might be some alternative gestures uh, for a mathematics education in, in, in this current time? And the word socio-ecological for me, I find a, a, a really helpful one. And as I say, it's really very ill-formed for me. Um, but the word I came across was from management studies, where what was written about in management studies was how in a lot of uh, theorizing, either the social or the ecological, have been taken to be fixed. And I suppose that links to what I was saying about the kind of perspectives that there's a sense um, within, well, I could take an activism, which, which is a perspective that, that, that I've written about and, and care very deeply about. One of the kind of classic pictures of an activism, I don't know if you can see, see my image, you have two kind of autopoetic entities that, that might be these little sort of circles with things going in and out. And then a line, I think this was Varela or Maturana had this diagram and then a line, and, and this is like the whole world underneath the line. And, it, and it's a bit like, yeah, that, that, that does feel like taking, taking, the, taking the ecological to be fixed, to, to, to you know, everything under the line, almost like the rest of the world gets reduced to a trigger at the boundary of an organism. So I suppose in saying socio-ecological, it's not wanting to, this phrase is not wanting to set up a binary here, um, but rather alerting us to the idea um, that any social problem has an ecological perspective and any ecological problem has a social perspective. So I might be using the words singly, but for me, whenever I'm doing that, it's pointing to, to, to one side of, of what is a, a, a combination, a sort of nested system. Um, so I suppose that's, what I want to tr try and think through, what, what might it be like if uh, we stop taking the ecological as a fixed background for mathematics education? And for me, that question became pressing through work that I felt very privileged to be part of uh, taking place in Mexico uh, with Amando Solares. And this was work that, um, came out of some, some UK money. Interestingly, the UK government um, uh, shifted its aid budget some years ago. I mean, it's massively cut the aid budget now. So actually all these projects have sort of gone. Um, but some time ago, it shifted money away from aid agencies and towards universities. And there was a pot of money called the Global Challenges Research Fund we could apply to. Uh, and, and that was where the money for, for this work came, came about. And it came about through a question. So Armando had connections with a number of scientists working in an area of Mexico um, that is uh, just south of Mexico City, where they had been doing work in the area for, for, for decades, actually, um, and were getting frustrated that they weren't able to have an impact on the schools in that area linked to the work they were doing. And so they came to Armando wanting some support for thinking about uh, how they could link in with education. So I want to give a little bit of context for where this work is taking place. Um, and it's in the Atayac River Basin, 
um, in an area called Tlaxcala, uh, which is known for its tortillas. Um, it was part, uh, Cara mentioned the World Universities Network project. So this was uh, connected, it was a separate project, but it was connected to the World Universities Network project. And, and that was a project that, that took place in, in, in these areas of the world. Um, but what I'm focusing on, on now is, is, is this area uh, in Mexico. And it has a very rich cultural heritage uh, that is captured uh, in, in many murals uh, around, around that area. Um, the area is used to have a lot of water. And, and in fact, the uh, waterways were, were, were um, historically very important parts of the community um, uh, and very linked to um, uh, the, the, the life of the community in, in, in many different ways. Um, so this is a map of the catchment area of the river Atayak. Um, and, oh, sorry, let's go one too fast. Um, what's happened in the last 20 years is a big industrialization of that area. And, and this was a deliberate policy of the Mexican government to, to bring in international companies in there. What has then happened is some quite devastating effects on the river. Um, so I was fortunate to, well, I'm not sure if fortunate is the word, but anyway, I, 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 yeah, in, in many ways, I was fortunate to be able to go and see the river. And you look at this view here and perhaps it doesn't look, nothing too much looks odd. It kind of looks a fairly normal color, but, but actually when you get a bit closer, um, there's this extraordinary smell. Actually, you don't even have to get very close to hear this to smell. This kind of smell that's a bit like a mixture between kind of paint thinner and um, I don't know, and sewage, paint thinner and sewage. The, the, the picture on the left is coming out of a VW car manufacturing plant that is regularly um, putting heavy metals uh, illegally in, into the river. Um, this is um, effluent from uh, Italian uh, fashion company that is regularly putting dyes into the river. So, so the river is often, so actually what, why that first picture looks relatively normal is it's just had some blue dye in it recently. And sometimes it's red, sometimes it's white, sometimes uh, different colors. Um, and not surprisingly, this river from having been this very sort of part of the life of the community, um, it, nobody goes there and, and it's become a dumping ground. And one of the striking things for me was getting close to the river there aren't even any insects living on it. So, so, so forget fish. I mean, fish haven't been there for 20 years. You, you don't even get the smallest of, of animals living, living on this river. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, if you map um, incidents of the sort of diseases on the left, those black splodges pretty much map the river course. Um, and this is part of what's being researched uh, for decades by the group of scientists who, who approached Armando about what might this be like. Uh, to, to, to try and work on this in an e educational context. And of course, that's not happening in a vacuum. So, so the, the community, of course, are very aware of what's been happening. And there's a lot of community activism that goes on uh, around the river. And they've had some high level delegations coming there. A sort of very big EU person came and everybody agrees this is illegal. And, and they're, they're, they're a great sort of you know, noise about how it must stop. And, and, it, and it just seems that the, the illegal pollution continues. Uh, so that was the context of this network, and the network is, is on the right. So this network comprises teachers in the area, um, NGOs, uh, sorry, I don't know if that's a Canadian um, acronym, non-governmental organizations who, who have been, been working uh, in the area supporting the health of the river, um, teacher educators, the scientists, uh, and, and, and then uh, and, and, and ourselves. Um, and the network has been focusing on two schools, uh, particularly, trying to think about what might it be like or, or in what ways could this context come into the curriculum? And a little bit more context is necessary here um, because in Mexico, the curriculum is very centralized. So textbooks are given to children each year, but what that means is a book for children to write in. So you have a textbook for maths that is given to each child and that's your book for the year. And there's kind of an expectation that you go through that book page by page. And so the same is true for many other subjects. So you have a situation where we have schools here where you can smell the river from a kilometer away in the school playground. And when that school is meant to do pollution in the textbook, they do pollution, they consider air pollution in Mexico City. Um, and so it's quite a challenging context to think about how might work about the river come into that context when teachers are so constrained. 
And I maybe should have said at the start that the mathematics, of course, is not center stage here. So, so I will come to where the mathematics comes in, but, but I think you get, you're getting the, the impression that, that it's, it's the, the, the mathematics wasn't, wasn't at the forefront of thinking, but, but of course was, you know, and there, here's one of the dilemmas. Of course, everybody was wanting to cover the curriculum content as well, and, and in fact had to. So the idea that emerged or co-emerged really out of the network um, was the idea to um, engage the schools in a memorial project. Well, in fact, memorial is not quite right. The, the, the Spanish word is memorias, but, but that means more memory than, than memorial. It doesn't have, and again, I'm not sure if there's an English uh, Canadian thing here, but, but for an English ear, memorial has connotations of death, which is not in the Spanish word. Um, but actually, I mean, I think the connotations of death are in a sense quite appropriate. It was what struck me from visiting the river was this is a dead river. Uh, and it had a really almost uncanny feel because it looked so like, without smelling it, healthy rivers that, that, that I knew. So the idea was to engage the schools or, and, and, and the schools were, were, you know, were part of this planning in creating a, a memorial project. And the idea was to have three galleries in this project. One looking at the past, one looking at the present and what's happening with the contamination, and one looking at the future, what might be some possibilities. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly go through those, those three, um, three galleries. So, so, so the first one was, was really about trying to reconstruct the memory of the river, the, the, the engaging with the community uh, in trying to remember what it was like when the river was healthy. Because, of course, one of the issues is that there's a normalization that happens about pollution. So this river has been polluted for so long that none of the children in primary school have ever known it any different. And indeed, many of the teachers, perhaps, uh, not, not even. And so there felt like a really significant thing about trying to link to the knowledge of grandparents and other elders about what life used to be like, um, just to, what, what used to be happening in the river. And so this was one of the galleries. And this Memorial Museum was created physically, and, and so, so it, it was created physically um, in the school, but the, the community group were, were so impressed by it that they, they've turned it into an itinerant museum as well. So it's gonna go around 29 uh, community centers uh, in, in the Atto in the River uh, region. The work was disrupted by COVID, of course. In Mexico, the schools were really hardly open um, during, during the COVID period, but, but the work somehow managed to, to carry on any, anyway. Um, the, oh, the second uh, gallery was about analyzing what's actually happening at the moment. So, so what, what is the process of uh, pollution that's taking place now? Um, and this is where some of the mathematics and science came in about trying to tabulate uh, and, and, and um, uh, evaluate the, 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 the levels of pollution taking place. And then the third river, sorry, the third uh, gallery felt a really significant one, which was about thinking about, well, what might be the route to a more healthy river? Uh, how, how might the children be supported to engage in social action uh, because it's completely illegal what's happening in the river. Um, it, it, it's not as though the environmental regulations are not there in the area um, and it's not as though this illegal pollution isn't known about but it's just that for whatever reason uh, uh, nothing's being done about it. I do want to touch on where the mathematics is for, for, for obvious reasons. As I said it, it's, it's not center stage um, and this is work that, that's still emerging but um, one of the things that, that in one of the areas, uh, there was a, a, a um, one of the things we've got most data on is a year two class. Uh, and, and these were some of the aspects of mathematics that, that uh, went on really across the first and second galleries where there was a focus on the biodiversity of the region. And so there was some really quite interesting work uh, in grade two uh, around collecting data about biodiversity, both um, from the interviews with, with elders in the community and comparing that to, to, to what's known now and, and, and comparing those graphs. So, so there was mathematics there, um, not center stage. Coming to reflect on what that work has been like, and it's, it's been going on for about a year and a half uh, and, and, and is continuing. Um, one of the things that I suppose has become very apparent to me 
is that the river is really at the center of concerns. And the river feels like it's one of these kind of uh, perhaps obvious examples of, of where the social and ecological come together. Um, you know, it's, it's the river that has been studied for decades and that, that seems very central to, to the whole context. Um, and it's dramatic changes in that river uh, that has provoked changes in lifestyles in the region, uh, both the, the, the disappearance of, of habits and rituals uh, around the river, and of course, the, 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 the terrible effects of the pollution that's there now. Um, and so it's, a, it's the river that's at the center of the community's uh, social activism. Um, and, and it's around the river that the research network uh, was conceived. Okay, so that was the example. And, and I want to sort of broaden out now a little bit and, and just, just offer a, a few more, more general comments. Um, so that was a context that, that, uh, that you know, the questions that were being asked there uh, felt to me like, like uh, we as researchers in the network were, were really struggling to, to make sense of what was going on or, or to find tools to, to, to help us um, to help us support what was going on without this kind of broadening of perspective into the non-human. And of course, there are many sources of inspiration for that work. And I've just listed some of them here, really. Um, the community group that we worked with are themselves, uh, they, 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 they uh, subscribe to ideas of political ecology, uh, which is a kind of movement uh, within community organizations, which again has this sense of, of the combination of the social and political and ecological. Um, and of course, the, the, yeah, the, the, these perspectives here have, have, have huge insights, it, it, it feels to me, in terms of making sense of working within a context such as the one I've just described. Um, and I guess if we're looking, this is a map I, I suspect might be familiar to some people in the room. Um, so, so to put, the, put what I'm talking about in the context of this map, um, I think we're talking at the, about the, the sort of right hand, bottom right hand uh, bit of the, of the picture here, thinking about I felt that the, 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 this, this context of the Atayak River was provoking the need for some eco-complexity discourse, for, for, for a sense of learning as, as a nested system. And so if I think about well, what, what philosophically is going on then to, to be taking up some kind of eco-complexity uh, positions as a socio-ecological socio perspective, um, and, and again, this is where I feel very ill-formed and really quite naive, um, but it feels ontologically that there's a shift to, to thinking about relations, not objects. And this, this is common to, to, to a lot of thinking for, from many different perspectives that I see going on at the moment. Um, I find this a helpful way of operationalizing that. Um, rather than asking who acts, a more relational question might be, how is it that such a subject is able to act in this way, which then brings in uh, socio-ecological concerns and, or perspectives. And epistemologically, I find myself increasingly going back to the work of Gregory Bateson, uh, who talked about the epistemological errors that, that we tend to take to the world when we see ourselves as individual entities. Uh, and Bateson talks about the need for wisdom. Uh, one, of, one of his sort of perhaps throwaway comments was that he felt his life work was trying to ensure that of the 100 people that survive, 20 will be wise. Um, um, yeah. The sense, I suppose, that, that we're all part of this, this systems of relations, uh, uh, trying to move away from some instrumental linear cause and effect uh, idea. And again, th these are not new ideas, of course, and, and, and many perspectives are, are thinking, thinking in this, this kind of way. So what might be some gestures, going back to that Latour quote, uh, what might be some gestures of the socio-ecological? Um, uh, this was a list that, that with uh, Kate and Armando and myself, you know, it feels, feels a really quite arbitrary set of things, but, 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 but I offer them anyway. Um, seems to be something about listening to the marginalized, the questions that they provoked, provoke, attending to the ecological precarity of communities and adaptations being made to issues such as pollution or climate change. And again, the questions that it provokes. Cara mentioned the World Universities Network project I've been involved in, and a lot of what's been, you know, well, something that's really taken our attention in that uh, project is, is the, the complex relations between local and global. And actually, 
how difficult it is to think about those uh, connections uh, in, in creative or in innovative ways. And one thing which Liz de Freitas and Natalie Sinclair has got us all doing on that project is, is engaging in some creative diagramming practices, which, which has been, been really interesting. And I suppose the last question about the mathematics, and, and here I, I feel critical mathematics education still has a lot to offer us about you know, tending to how mathematics formats the, the socio-ecological world. So I want in the last, I think I've got about eight more minutes. Um, I wanna use that time to, to, to suppose what feels like a complete gear change perhaps, but to think about, well, what might all this mean in a very different context? So, so what about if there isn't a community organization or network or anything like that around that, 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 that we can engage in? And, and what if the curriculum is, is even more highly constrained than the one I've described in, in, in Mexico? Are socio-ecological gestures of, of any, any relevance in, in, in this kind of context? And I suppose one question I might have, which feels to me linked to the socio-ecological is, well, if the world can't come into the classroom, if, if there are sort of too many institutional barriers for, for letting the world knock at the classroom door, perhaps we can think about, well, can at least the mathematics come alive in the classroom? There was an article written um, just the other day in the Spanish BBC about a man called Dictator, who I know will be known to many people here. Dictator was a close uh, friend and, and co collaborator with uh, David Wheeler. And there was a description in this article of a lesson that Dick Tata taught where he invited a child to come to the board and, and draw, draw a dot. So the child came and drew a dot on, on, on the blackboard. And then Dick's question was, what should we name this point? And apparently the child put a hand up and said, George. So the point was named George. And, and it wasn't described how the lesson went on from there. But um, I guess all of us can kind of imagine the kind of things that might happen next. Um, uh, perhaps Dick imposed a constraint about when a point moves, it has to have a different name or something. But this was heading towards uh, the idea of coordinates um, and, and, and creating coordinates for points and sort of some sort of grid system. And, and again, you can imagine, uh, I'm sure, the kind of things that might have taken place. I suppose what struck me in, in that short anecdote is a sense of the aliveness of mathematics. So coordinates aren't this thing that are kind of imposed and it's like, oh, you've got to learn to go along the corridor and up the stairs. But there's a genuine question about how do we refer unambiguously to, to things that, that, that we need to refer to? How, how do we communicate as a group? And, and we can engage as a community in, in that, uh, thinking through what, what the, the constraints of that situation. And, and Dick, I'm sure, holding the, the, the mathematical constraints within that. And it's this kind of idea of a lesson that was behind work that Natalie Sinclair and I have done thinking about what we've come to call symbolically structured environments. And this was also thinking about what's going on in some of the examples of uh, Seymour Papa, for instance, and Mindstorms, some of the work of Bob Davis at the Rutgers Institute, and some of the extraordinary videos of what Bob Davis was getting students to do. Uh, you know, children aged six doing negative numbers and 15 year olds working on monotonic decreasing sequences and so on. And it seemed they were doing something that wasn't just problem solving. Uh, so these weren't quite problem solving environments that people like Dick Tata and Bob Davis, as I said, were, were getting children into. But there seemed to be something, and one metaphor I have here is of a hose pipe, that there was some very constrained beginning. Uh, and this is where the symbols being offered to stand for actions and distinctions. Um, children sort of supported into some sort of game-like situation where symbol use is governed by mathematical rules, um, constraints embedded in the structuring of the environment, which of course might be technological as well. Very significantly, but I'm not really gonna be able to touch on this point C, seems to be the idea of the symbols being able to be linked to their inverse. Um, and the idea of being able to constrain complexity while still engaging in a mathematically integral whole environment. And crucially, where symbolic novel symbolic moves can be made. So I've got a dilemma here, because I have got a couple of examples. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll do the first, first one. Um, okay, this is where you might need the chat. I, you've been notably, notably silent on chat so far. Uh, so, okay. These are both eight dot shapes. 
is the information I'm telling you. These are both eight dot shapes. I'd like you to either, if you've got pen and paper there in front of you or just in your mind, draw another different eight dot shape. Please have a go at that now. Please draw another different eight dot shape. And if we were in a classroom, I might invite somebody to come up and draw it on the board. So let's say we had those two shapes drawn there. So you could put a Y or an N in the chat now. So that third shape along, the little sort of upside down L, um, is that an eight dot shape or not? Yes or no? Is that third one along an eight dot shape? Is that an eight dot shape? Would you say yes or no? No, says Joe. Yes, says Joe. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that third one is an eight dot shape. Kara says yes. That third one is an eight dot shape. Okay, the fourth one along, is that an eight dot shape? Is the fourth one an eight dot shape? And I'm going to tell you that the fourth one is not an eight dot shape. The fourth one, in fact, is a nine dot shape. Uh, okay, so we can't really do this as I'd like to in a classroom. <laughs> we, I'd want to make this much more dramatic, but I'm, I'm out of time and, and I can't see you. Um, huh, says Cara. So the fourth one's a nine dot shape. Yeah, nice, okay. So why is that last one a nine dot shape? Okay, well, you might have to think about that. Um, so what we might go on to do is, or no, what we might, what we would definitely go on to do is to start naming uh, things here. So I'm gonna introduce some symbols now. Uh, so B is the number of dots on the boundary of the shape, and I is the number of dots on the inside. So you can have a look at the values for B and I there. And this might give you a sense of why the last one is a nine dot shape and the others are eight dot shapes. So there's no choice about this, okay, now. So this is, we're in the hose pipe still here. So, so, so this is, you have to adopt this convention. I'm not gonna allow you in a classroom, if you tell, tell me you wanna do curb shapes, not allowed. If you tell me you, you wanna not count dots on the outside, not allowed. You, you've gotta do it this way. This is how we're doing it. Um, and what we might then start looking at is, is we might start gathering. So, so from our eight dot shapes, we might start looking at, at what we've got here and, and you might start seeing some patterns here. And, and again, we've not really got time for this, um, but you might start seeing some patterns. And at the moment you start noticing patterns and, and asking some questions, it feels like some mathematics can begin. And it's at this point that the creativity and, and, and the space can, can, can be allowed. So, so okay, have, have a look at some other eight dot shapes. So choose another eight dot shape. So, you know, somebody might say, can you find one with three on the inside? Great, can I look at nine dot shapes? Yes, okay, go and create a table for nine dot shapes. And at this point, uh, the creativity, as I say, can, can, can arise. So, so the symbols being used for, for, for distinctions, symbol used governed by the constraints that are imposed by the teacher. The sense of the inverse really comes from the table. So, so the table then begs questions about what else might be possible in the table. So can we have a five, three? Can we have a four, four? Can we have four on the boundary, four on the inside? Could we have three on the boundary, five on the inside, and so on? This sense of constraining the complexity while still engaging in a whole environment, novel symbolic moves being possible. Okay, there was gonna be one other possible task, but we were never gonna have time for that. <laughs> okay, very briefly then to, to, to wrap up. Uh, our experience of working with symbolically structured in environments is that students can become highly engaged. Uh, learning can be energetic, rapid, um, and it's possible to engage across very widely differing levels of prior attainment. Um, and a sense that there can be very genuine student choice about what they do. Uh, but within this environment, so I know, for example, in this task, that whatever you do, you're gonna be working on area. So actually all I care about is we're gonna do lots of work on area. So I don't care whether you do 11 dot shapes or six dot shapes or 500 dot shapes, because what I want is this focus on, on how we find areas of shapes. If we can't bring the ecological into the classroom, perhaps students can start asking their own questions within mathematics. And I suppose my hope is that that might become a way of being that extends to other aspects of their lives. These were just some examples of students sort of working and, and it's just really to show you, I suppose, I don't know, I, I see some sense of the energy of, of the work in, in, the, in the sort of work being written there. So final thoughts. There's nothing of course about a community project that makes it engaging. I know a geography colleague of mine talking about climate change fatigue in schools. So whatever we're doing in school, there is a need, I feel, to dramatize the curriculum. And if it's not possible to open to the knocking of the world at the classroom door, 
Is it possible to offer experiences of the agency of the mathematics as something which students can hit up against? And I suppose a thing which I've not touched on at all, but feels another important aspect of this, what might be components of a mathematics curriculum in waiting that might feel more relevant to an ecological emergency and where the two examples that I showed might not be so jarringly different about a kind of community work and, and, and work in a classroom on, on area. You know, what might be the other topics like systems theory and catastrophe theory that, that we might be developing in a curriculum in waiting? Thank you for your attention and the invitation to speak. Fantastic. I'm going to jump in there for a second half. That was one. That was amazing. I'm very excited to carry on. And I'm also so excited that you mentioned Stephen Kahn, who has two present presentations today as well, which will be a nice overlap to see. And I and I'm reminded of uh, the example of the child learning to walk. They don't actually walk. They run, you know, and I think that that's been brought up again with listening to your talk today mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. very, very inspirational. <laughs> I think this goes over to Josh. <laughs> oh, time for questions. We have time oh, for right. No, we have 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Seven probably now, but anyway. Oh, good. You're good on the time. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So there are some questions in the chat. I, mean, I don't know if, I, if someone's sharing this or, or what's, Josh, you, you leave yeah. me. Um, there's a whole bunch of comments and, uh, and questions in the chat. Um, one question is, uh, why does this have to be part of math curriculum and not say social studies? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. It's a really challenging point. Um, I mean, I've got three children. Well, actually our oldest just left school. I mean, so two, 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 two school age children. I mean, they're totally bored by maths in school. Uh, you know, why on earth are they learning how to do the long division algorithm uh, when, when they, they'll, you know, I mean, th their questions are really valid. I mean, it seems to me maths has a huge potential to, so I don't think there's anything, any sort of has to, but I just, I do think mathematics has a huge potential to offer insight into social ecological problems. And, and not in the curriculum as we've got it now, but, 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 but potentially, you know, thinking about non-Euclidean geometries, the sort of sense of how mathematics is so linked to assumptions. You know, there just feel to be so many potentially powerful insights about the world that, that we might gain through the study of mathematics if we were able to, uh, I suppose, in, in, engage in, in, in a way in which the subject comes alive uh, and, and perhaps touching on, on, on some of the more, more modern aspects of the, of the curriculum uh, uh, that, 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 that seem to be blocked at the moment. Mm. And I, I mean, I really like Peter's comment there. I, I mean, Peter, do, do, would you like? Would you mind? To, would you like mind speaking to that? Well, he's finding me on mute. I'll read it for everyone. It strikes me that it is a real power of mathematics: is that it does not have to be center stage; that it should always be there for us when the river is rightly center stage. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Alfie. Yeah. Take it away. <laughs> well, we always want to be part of the world, and the world deserves to be part of us. See, and uh, if I can just say two words, what Peter just said, I mean, it's really connected with my question, and that is that uh, it kind of bothers me that in school, every subject other than mathematics shies away from mathematics. When mathematics is so integral to, to geography, social studies and everything else. So my question was not, why don't we do it in mathematics? The question is, why don't we do it elsewhere as well? Because I think that's part of the problem because kids in school, they box it. Okay, now we go to a boring math class. Now we do geography and there's no math in it. See, it kind of becomes very drastic. Uh, actually, I've heard one of our uh, indigenous members said that in Alberta, lots of people, lots of indigenous kids go into social sciences and social work. Why? Because there's guaranteed there's absolutely no mathematics in it. And that, that, that's really sad. Lovely, thank you. Um, th th there, see Emily another... there. Emily was telling, giving us an example. Can the boreal folk be the lungs of the world? 
that's sort of another and the math that came out of that. I also have Howard asking you to talk more about the five-year-old learning negative numbers. <laughs> so take your pick. <laughs> okay. Well, I can, I can post you a little clip. I mean, that there was, um, yeah, I mean, that, that was for me a really powerful uh, sort of inspiration for the idea of a symbolically structured environment actually was really studying over a number of years, Bob Davis working with a group of five-year-old children um, getting them engaging in negative numbers. I mean, I've shown this clip to primary teachers who kind of fall off their chair looking at it because it, you know, it, it flies in the face of sort of Piagetian orthodoxy of what might be possible with children of that age. Um, I, can, I can send you a clip of, 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 of the work. I mean, the basic idea is you have a bag of stones. One kid says go, and another kid says how many stones they want to put into the bag. Um, and then uh, a third kid uh, says how many stones they want to take out of the bag. And Bob Davis records this. Um, and this is the kind of inverse, I suppose, and the idea of symbolizing actions that, so you put three stones in and he writes a three, you take three stones out and you write subtract three. And it can be easy to think that the three is the number of stones, but I don't think it is. The three is a change in the number of stones. So the three is symbolizing the fact you've got three more in the bag than you did when the first kid said go. And in this way of symbolizing, it's then transparent for the kids. You put, can put three in and you take five out. Well, we've got two less than we started with. There's nothing complex about that. And so you have these kids writing things like three take away five equals negative two. And I think it's because of this symbolizing of actions um, where, where they, you know, and, and you have the, the putting in and the undoing. And so you have this doing and, and, and so you can symbolize the inverse as well. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, maybe email me and, and I can send, send you a, a clip, uh, a, a, a link to the clip. Wonderful. Um, I think that's about the end of, uh, of our question period time. Um, I know that if I had answered your original chat question uh, at the beginning, I would have said cold or maybe even tired, but uh, I'm definitely feeling inspired after hearing your talk. That would be the word I would use right now. So thank you for that. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, everybody. All right, I'll, um, I'll transition here to uh, introduce Nick Wasserman. Uh, Nick is an associate professor of mathematics education at Teachers College, Columbia University. And I'm going to, I hope I'm not being too reductive here um, to sum up your work in a, in a single sentence, but Dr. Washman's research looks at the relationship between secondary mathematics teachers, content knowledge, and their classroom practices. Um, and we're, we're really pleased and happy you're here to join us this morning. So welcome and uh, feel free to take it away. All right, thank you. Give me just a second to share a screen and see if all the technology works. So does this look like it's supposed to look to people on the other side of it? Yes, are we good? That looks great. Uh, great, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation um, to be here. I'm a new member um, in, in this sort of group and, and, and glad to be here today. Um, as stated in the in introduction, a lot of my work thinks about uh, mathematical coursework and teacher education. And so this will be a transition away from Elf's talk in some regards. Um, uh, but when we think about mathematical coursework that often happens at the university level, and we'll think, be thinking about mathematical practice in that uh, coursework as a way to develop pedagogy, as a way to think about um, fostering the aims of teacher education. So that's the goal for the talk today. We'll start out with some sort of big picture ideas uh, and end with some specific studies and implications. So there's a tension in secondary teacher preparation that on the one hand, secondary math teachers, this is middle and high school, um, they need a sufficiently deep uh, and robust sense of mathematics. And yet on the other hand, this is not everything that they need to prepare them uh, to be teachers. So there's this tension and it's really evident in uh, mathematical coursework. How do you accomplish those aims when you're in the context of mathematics coursework? And in particular, more advanced mathematics coursework. I'm thinking of university level math courses like real analysis and abstract algebra that secondary math teachers are often re required to take 
how do we accomplish some of those aims in those contexts? So this is sort of a big driving question around my work, which is, are there ways to teach those courses that can be more effective mathematical preparation for secondary teachers? And the very specific question we'll look at today is, how can we meaningfully discuss pedagogy and develop teachers' pedagogical practice in those courses when those courses are primarily about mathematics? How can we accomplish some of these aims in teacher education of being able to talk about pedagogical practice and develop that um, as a part of the teacher education process in these particular courses? So there's, there's a unique challenge um, in, in these courses these sort of more advanced mathematical courses, and that is that the ideas discussed in them um, are ones that are really never explicitly discussed with secondary students. When you're talking about groups in abstract algebra, the idea isn't that the teacher is going to go talk about groups in a secondary context. And so there's sort of a unique challenge in teacher education um, with them. Felix Klein described this often as the double discontinuity that teachers face. And one of his approaches was thinking about elementary mathematics from an advanced standpoint. I've aimed to kind of build on that, um, thinking about um, what I've described as the knowledge of non-local mathematics for teaching. So if we think about the, the local content, the neighborhood of mathematics that a teacher is teaching, there's mathematical ideas outside of that. And the question is, how do those I mathematical ideas outside of the sort of immediate content being taught shape uh, and influence a teacher um, uh, teaching that sort of local immediate content. As a part of this, I adapted a cognitive model for mathematical knowledge for teaching that ended up describing kind of two phases. One is that the non-local mathematics somehow must be a mathematically powerful understanding. It must serve to kind of reshape the teacher's understanding of the local content being taught um, but that this in and of itself is insufficient, that those ideas developed also need to be pedagogically powerful. There needs to be implications for teaching. Uh, and that this is a really tough tension uh, in these advanced mathematics courses to accomplish. So just big picture speaking, there's several domains um, being considered. We have these university advanced, which includes advanced mathematics courses, we have secondary mathematics. We have the teaching of secondary mathematics. And what I wanna point out is that these are really about mathematical ideas. When, when Klein was talking about connecting elementary mathematics from an advanced standpoint, he was talking about making mathematical connections. And yet the teaching of secondary mathematics lies somewhere else. We can think about it as relation to the aims that we might have pedagogically about how instruction, how, how the teaching and learning of mathematics happens. And so we want to have mathematically powerful understandings develop, but we also want some kind of pedagogically powerful understanding to be fostered. This would be a way of accomplishing some of the aims in teacher education. And so in, in the teaching of these university courses, we want to do things that help accomplish this. And so the question we'll be asking, or I'll be asking today is, how can we sort of foster better opportunities for teachers to learn from their experiences in these university math courses where they're developing some of these kinds of understandings? So um, ULTRA was a, a project in a real analysis course. Um, you can find out more about that project if you, if you have an interest there at that website, but like ALF, the ideas that I share today are, are certainly shaped by um, many colleagues, um, a large number of which come from the collaborative work um, that, that this project was across several institutions uh, and, and, and several members. And so the ideas I'm sharing today were shaped um, often in this context. The, the end product of ULTRA was the design of 12 modules that could be incorporated into a real analysis course. To be clear, these modules were not the entirety of the real analysis course. They were modules that were designed around specific real analysis content that could be inserted at 12 different points um, in a real analysis course, but there were things happening outside of that. This project did a lot of development work and, and I'll share an example uh, image, so, so an example of kind of what, 
was a part of these modules, but I'll also want to share some of the research work that went into this. And so I'll share um, findings from a particular study um, that, that was related to this work. So <clears throat> as a part of those modules, within those modules, we had a, a fairly different instructional model that we were aiming with those mod modules um, that was building up from and stepping down to teaching practice. That is, we wanted to make explicit some of these connections to teaching, not just connections to mathematics. And that led us to a model within those 12 modules that would begin with teaching as a way to motivate the study of real analysis. And then the way in which we organized the real analysis study uh, was done in such a way that we would be able to talk about the implications for that uh, in relation to teaching. And so this was our instructional model. It's very different, I would say, than what typically happens in an advanced mathematics course, which is really, you just focus on the advanced mathematics. Um, we were explicitly within these modules trying to connect to teaching. We had kind of two, um, uh, two ideas that we held, held up when we were related, engaged in this project, and that is that the advanced math needed to be true to a real analysis course, not something that got watered down, uh, and that the responses to the pedagogical situations that we ended up discussing in these 12 modules needed to be improved in some way, some meaningful way by learning the advanced mathematics. And this led us to try to be explicit about our pedagogical aims. And it was in that that we, that I'll frame a lot of the work um, that I'll share today um, as pedagogical mathematical practices. So I'm sure you are, are all familiar with this image. This is Schulman's uh, sort of original conceptualization of pedagogical content knowledge. And I'll simply point out that he was looking at domains of knowledge, that is the products of subject matter, um, and looking at the intersection. So we can have mathematical knowledge, the sort of end product of that, and pedagogical knowledge. And we think about this intersection. We tried to think about later on the same things, but with domains of practice, the processes of these um, different sort of disciplines, domains, uh, and then we tried to think about the intersection. So mathematical practices are those, not the products, not the knowledge, but the activities in which mathematicians might regularly engage to produce those products. And the same with teaching. These are the practices or activities that mathematics teachers regularly engage, all components of their work. And we were trying to look at things that felt like they were shared, that there were again, reasonably shared across both mathematicians and mathemati mathematics teachers, that these, that these practices felt like um, they were useful for mathematicians, but also useful for mathematics teachers. And so this became a way in which for us to think about the pedagogical aims in, in our ultra modules in this real analysis course. And so a part of this, was we tried to be very explicit about what those were, to be clear, what I'll share here is not an exhaustive list. These are specific to the 12 module particular teaching situations um, that we were describing. <clears throat> but we were, we were wanting to talk about in this real analysis course, the idea that pedagogically, it's important to acknowledge and revisit visions, to think about the mathematical constraints or limitations uh, of a situation, that this is a pedagogical aim that's helpful in teaching. We similarly had um, other kind of aims, things like using special cases, seeking out multiple explanations. And the key point is that these are all things that happen also as a mathematical practice, but also tend to translate into good pedagogical practice. And so um, these were the explicit goals. I wanna give an example um, of this, of what this looked like from one of our modules. And I'll be using that first um, sort of pedagogical aim. In a real analysis course, it's very common um, that you need to teach the proofs about the derivative rules to prove that the power rule works, to prove the product rule for derivatives and other kinds of derivative rules. It's common in a real analysis course to prove those. And so we designed a module around that content. And we were thinking specifically of the ped this pedagogical aim that it's important for teachers to acknowledge and revisit assumptions 
mathematical constraints or limitations. And so we often in this particular module describe this as attention to scope, the domain for which a statement or an argument holds. So statements and arguments often have a kind of explicit domain for which they would hold. And that's what we mean by attention to scope. So how did we teach real analysis content and discuss pedagogical practice? Well, essentially we, we ordered the real analysis content to make explicit attention to scope as a mathematical practice so that it, it became clear that this was something that is mathematical practice. And we saw this in the real analysis content. We then discussed secondary teaching situations where this kind of attention to scope might also be good pedagogical practice. So this was the way in which we use the real analysis content. We use mathematical practice as a way to, to try to develop pedagogical practice. And so in particular, in one of the modules, the derivative proofs, we, we, we gave students a proof of the power rule. This is a very common proof. The power rule states that if we have a function x to the n, then its derivative is n times x to the n minus one. And they were given this proof. And essentially, this is a proof that's in the textbook um, that's commonly proved. What's interesting about this proof is that there are parts of the argument that are really limited to natural numbered exponents. That is, this proof really only substantiates the power rule for natural numbered exponents. And yet the power rule itself holds for real numbered exponents. And so we're explicitly asking them to attend to the scope of the argument here in this real analysis context to highlight something that is mathematical practice. We then sequenced the proofs of the product and reciprocal quotient rules um, to show that the power rule then must hold for the integers. And then subsequently, uh, that it must hold for the rationals and reals. In other words, we sequence these proofs in a particular way to make explicit this, math this mathematical practice of attention to scope. We then talked about um, implications in connection to teaching. When might this sort of attention to scope be useful? There's all kinds of ways we describe mathematical ideas um, that, that have similar attention to scope issues, things like exponents being just repeated multiplication, where this would be true with natural numbered exponents, but wouldn't make a whole lot of sense with other exponents, or things like to take the derivative, just bring the number down to the front and, and subtract one from the exponent. Again, there's a scope for which this statement is true. And it's really important that teachers pedagogically attend to some of these things, um, because communicating about mathematical ideas in everyday language often brings in some ambiguity that, that it's helpful to pay attention to um, thinking about students and, and how students are learning and conceptualizing these ideas. And so essentially we were, we were trying to use mathematical practice in the real analysis context as a way to talk about um, and develop teachers' pedagogical ideas. And so this is a study from some of that work. Uh, and I wanna share some of the findings from that. In, the, in an iteration of this ultra course, we had 31 pre-service and in-service teachers. I use the acronym PISTS. I'm not angry, I promise. It's a terrible acronym, I, I know, uh, and I apologize in advance for that acronym, but I'll use that to describe pre-service and in-service teachers. We're not, we're not talking necessarily about the work they did in the course, which we, we collected lots of information from, but we ended up following six teachers in into their academic, in the academic year, um, following their enrollment in this course into their own secondary classrooms. And it's with that subset of six teachers that I'm asking the question, how did teachers learn about pedagogical practice as they were actually out doing it from their activities in, in the real analysis course? What opportunities to learn about teaching were there uh, from their perspective? And so from those 31 teachers, there were about 12 who had jobs lined up as secondary teachers. We invited everyone, seven agreed, six ultimately were able to participate. And they taught a variety of subjects, not just calculus. Our aim was to observe teachers six times. We, we sort of looked at their scope and sequence to identify some lessons to go observe. We audio recorded, collected all kinds of information from their classrooms during those observations. 
And then we conducted post-lesson stimulated recall interviews with the teachers. We can see we, 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 we ended up uh, observing a total of 34 lessons across a variety of contexts uh, and subject matter in secondary mathematics. During the observation, the researcher sort of segmented lessons into a sequence of what we call teaching moments, relatively small teaching moments. And during the interviews, we asked teachers about those particular teaching moments. We asked them for the rationale, what it is they were doing, why they were doing the things they were doing um, in their classrooms. And, and then from those interviews, we looked for ones to sort of further analyze. And we, and we focused in on ones where in some way or another, they alluded to aspects of the real analysis course. They did this sort of freely and spontaneously uh, at various times during the interviews. Um, there were 167 such teaching moments where, where during the interviews they had mentioned something um, that alluded to the real analysis course. And so the first way we analyzed those teaching moments were describing teachers' pedagogical act action, what it is they were doing in that moment. And because these were in relation to the course, these often exemplified one of the course objectives, like the pedagogical aims that I shared earlier. We then um, in, a, in those 167 teaching instances, there were 148 where, where teachers were pretty clear about which aspect of the course they were saying they had the opportunity to learn these ideas. What was most relevant and most influential for, for the actions they were taking in their classrooms. And so we coded their attributions based on the kinds of activities they referenced from the course. These aligned with our instructional model initially, where it might've been talking about teaching situations, it might have been talking about some secondary mathematics ideas, and it might have been talking about real analysis. We see a teacher in response sort of saying, yeah, yeah, this reminds me of the exponents lesson as I'm doing this thing in my own classroom where we make these vast generalizations. This is referring to that pedagogical situation where we discussed uh, that, that idea in, in a pedagogical context. And so she's referring that this was referring to the pedagogical situation. But there also became a need, we observed, for other kinds of attributions that teachers were making. This was modeled practice. They were basically saying, my obser me observing the real analysis instructor somehow was influential on my thinking about teaching. Uh, and the other being specific resources, things that they tried to take from that course and use. Instances could have multiple codes. And so there were a total of 199 attributions that these teachers made. And I'll share three quick findings um, that you can read more about here in, uh, in the paper cited up, to, up top. The first is that they really did incorporate some of these pedagogical aims into their own teaching. The second is that the attributions they gave were primarily to the pedagogical learning activities to talking about the teaching situations and to observing the pedagogical approach of the instructor. But they also were very clear that there were mathematical learning opportunities from real analysis in particular. And the third is that the attributions they gave for incorporating some of those pedagogical aims were actually to the mathematical aspects of the course to real analysis. And so as one quick example um, of this, we saw teachers regularly um, doing things like attending to scope in their class practice. We see a teacher observing, talking about the factor theorem, and you see her very specifically describing factors could be complex or real numbers in, in, in the sort of general case. And as she's describing different ways to understand the factor theorem, one example she gives is, factors as being x-intercepts of the graph. And when she does that, she very clearly specifies, when I'm talking about x-intercepts, they would have to be real solutions here. So you see her attending to the scope of in inferring a factor from, a, from an x-intercept, that, that we're only really thinking about the real factors when we do that. And that this is very much related to some of her experiences from the, the, the ultra course, in particular, talking about that exponents lesson and this idea that we kind of make these vast generalizations, she was trying to avoid that in her teaching and we see her doing that. The attributions they gave from a teacher perspective 
Um, there were 148 instances, and because we had multiple attributions, there were 199 attributions. And essentially, those attributions were to one of five. Things. I'm using a Venn diagram to depict them here, uh, but I've given totals for each of those five different things that they were making attributions to. And the top one was the cases of teaching. This is talking about the teaching situations. They, they basically said, this was where I learned, or these were the most influential aspects of the course, where I learned um, to sort of engage in doing what I'm doing in the classroom. That is the model when we were very explicit about talking about pedagogy seemed to be useful. Second to this was them talking about model practice. This was also very influential, them observing an, inst an instructor and essentially saying, I'm learning about teaching from observing a mathematics instructor. But non-trivially, they also mentioned very clearly real analysis became something that was valuable and they were attributing their learning about pedagogy strictly to some of the real analysis activities from the course, some of the particular proofs and, and, and real analysis ideas um, they, were, they were attributing to their learning about pedagogy. And this happened often in relation to some of those pedagogical aims. This is that first pedagogical mathematical practice where they, they did talk about the exponents lesson, those sort of cases of teaching or modeled practice, but they were also very clear that they were learning this from engagement in the real analysis activities um, and the key point, and I'll basically be ending here, is that an emphasis on mathematical activity served as a bridge. We see from this work that teachers found the mathematical activity in real analysis and attributed that as one way that, that, that they were learning about pedagogical ideas, that they were learning about things that were shaping how they were going to teach in their futures. And so this became one way, sort of a bridge between the real analysis activities, um, emphasizing mathematical practice became one way in which we talked about uh, and, and accomplished developing teachers pedagogy. I will stop there for time purposes and say thank you very much. If you're interested in more work, there's some resources, one of which uh, is very recent, came out earlier this month. I'll stop sharing and say thank you very much and open time for questions. Thank you very much, Nick. That was perfect timing and uh, a fascinating presentation. Um, if you have some questions, um, commit those to the chat or you can use the hand function. Um, I can start us off while we're waiting for questions uh, coming in. Your, it's not, uh, you know, perfectly related, but you made me, you reminded me of some conversations I've had on the math ed side with the faculty of departments of math. And we're talking about, you know, what content knowledge these kids, what courses these students need as secondary teachers, you know, do they need the content knowledge in, I'm going to highlight linear algebra two. That was the one that was like, well, we can do away with that. That's was the consensus. And I, I feel like your work can, could impart some nuance on that conversation that we're not uh, in having that kind of conversation, really taking the whole picture in by just saying that content knowledge is unimportant or that one is important for these secondary teachers. I'm not sure if you'd like to, if you can speak to that. I know it's not a perfectly formulated question. Yeah, it's a great question. We, we often, um, in, in some of this work, we, we often get the sort of question around, well, are, are you working in an ideal world or sort of the, the world we live in? And um, I would say, a lot of this work is acknowledging that teachers have to take some particular math courses. And, and, and we don't see that changing anytime soon, right? So real analysis and abstract algebra are these sort of pillars that teachers are have been required to take, likely will be continue to require to take. And our goal was to think about how might we use those courses um, to accomplish some aims in teacher education. But you're certainly right in asking, were some of those ideas specific to the particular content of real analysis or the particular content of abstract algebra. And I think in lots of situations, um, maybe not. The, especially when we were emphasizing mathematical practices, those run in any course that you engage in. They can be emphasized in almost um, 
any discussion, one of the things that's been interesting for me to think about is the way in which the particular mathematical practices that we focused on in the real analysis course were, were sort of very particularized to the field of analysis, the way that analysts think and approach their work. Being really ex explicit about you know, scope and, and domain is something that analysts do really well, right? But, but in other areas, would you have come up with a slightly different subset of mathematical practices that abstract algebra or discrete mathematics or you know, uh, non-Euclidean geometry? Would, would the, the mathematical practices that are salient in those kinds of coursework and experiences be, be different? And, and so I think it, I find it really interesting to imagine, um, you know, what are the affordances in some ways of real analysis for accomplishing some of these pedagogical practices? Um, because they relate really particularly to the mathematical practices of doing analysis of some, of some sort. That was a very long winded, winded answer to your question, Josh, um, but maybe that's given people time to, to post other questions in the chat. There's actually some great questions. That was an excellent answer. And there's some great questions and really nice comments connecting uh, your work with, with ELFS. I'm going to pick up on a two kind of two-parter here. Uh, is there such a thing as, quote, specialized content knowledge, end quote, for secondary teachers? And do representations play a role? And uh, I'm just going to say part B here. In other words, are there other courses other than math taught by math departments that should, could be included for teachers? Yes, absolutely. I, I, um, as I mentioned at the outset, the sort of um, teachers need to be prepared, have sufficiently deep understanding of mathematics, but there's also other things that they need to be prepared for. We were looking particularly at math courses and asking the question, how can we, um, how can we sort of accomplish some of those aims in teacher education in that context? But that doesn't negate the need for other kinds of coursework. And I would certainly say, absolutely, there is sort of a specialized content knowledge for secondary teachers. I think, um, I think there's still work needing to be done um, to, to elaborate exactly what that is. And I think this notion around not just knowledge, but practice is one that needs to be increasingly incorporated into those conversations. Excellent. I think we're right up against time. So thank you so much for that um, really fascinating discussion. And I think, Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you. Is that correct? And I encourage people Thanks, to everybody. make sure you're all reading the chats, but there's some really nice comments in the chat. So thank you again. All right. And thank you uh, to the for those two excellent talks. Uh, we are going to go to the breakout uh, portion of today's forum, or the first one. Um, and uh, for those who are looking for uh, an access or maybe some more information on uh, what's going to be happening within uh, within the different uh, breakout rooms, I'm just posting a link to the agenda uh, for those who might not have it on hand. Um, and I'm just going to load this up on the screen as well. Uh, so for our first breakout session, which will be for the research uh, first set of research reports, uh, we're going to have three breakout rooms. Um, we've got a little set of instructions at the bottom here uh, for those uh, who are maybe uh, switching from uh, another application to Zoom. Uh, so you should be able to see the breakout rooms popping up uh, in the bottom left corner or bottom right corner there if you're on a computer. <clears throat> Otherwise, on a phone, uh, you should also see an option pop up. Uh, so for the breakout rooms, uh, we are going to have uh, in the first room uh, Brent Davis, Krista Francis, and Joe Towers from the University of Calgary, joined by Josh Markle, uh, Brock, um, on the subject of speaking of learning, exploring the, con the constraints of native languages on mathematical pedagogy. In breakout room two, uh, we'll have Kelly Marcelino from Western University uh, speaking to exploring the impact of elective pre-calculus modules in first year calculus. And in breakout room three, we'll have Kwesi Yarrow from the University of Alberta, as well as Ann Anderson from UBC, uh, talking about uh, supporting children's mathematics learning, lessons from Black African immigrant and refugee families. Um, so we're going to get the breakout room started right now. Uh, and uh, we'll have a couple of minutes before 
um, things start. Uh, but once in the rooms, uh, we will have, of course, more uh, fulsome uh, introductions uh, by the um, uh, facilitators themselves. Hey, Chaz, can I add something before people go? Absolutely. Um, I see a lot of, um, you know, interaction and questions and comments on the chat. I just want to remind everybody, um, after the uh, second set of reports, we have um, some time to come back together here. And um, there could be a chance to follow up some of the things that have uh, been discussed from our invited speakers here. That's it, Charles. All right. So uh, the rooms are open. Uh, and um, I'll leave this on the screen. If anyone's having difficulty getting in, uh, just drop a line in the chat. Okay, so as, uh, as, as we can see, the options for this next session uh, are definitely vast. Uh, we have, we're gonna have seven breakout rooms available. And um, I don't know, Joyce, if you wanted to give a brief overview uh, of, uh, of what's to come here. Okay, so we have um, a sort of a mix here of um, sessions happening. Um, we have five, uh, sessions that will be focusing on postal. So the sense is that uh, you will be welcome to go in the room for the posters and you'll find, of course, the presenters there. And um, in a similar way that probably we do face-to-face, -face, but it's not, but you'll be able to interact with the presenters about their work. Um, you can leave the room and go to another poster if you are satisfied with the interaction and, uh, and so forth. So that's for the poster, but we have parallel to the posters happening, uh, short orals where we have two presentations. Um, each one will be taking about 10 minutes presentation and five minutes uh, question and answers. So if you, choose to go to the short orals, you'll have at least to stay for the duration of the short oral that you probably want to see. And if you wanna move out and go to another room, you're welcome to go back. And I think you will need to go back to the main room, right, Charles, in order to uh, get- that, That's correct, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you need to get back to the main room in order to get to, to the sessions that you want to move through. Okay. Or you can stay for, the duration of the poster and the duration of the short orals in that room. 
All right, so I'm going to open up the rooms. Uh, so these should all be available. And once again, if anyone's having trouble getting into the room that they're uh, trying to get into, just, just pop a message on chat and we'll sort it out. Okay, Charles, I'm going to just start circulating, make sure everyone's being able to set up. Okay, you'll see a lot. 105, we've, we're going to have some additional time for debrief and discussion, just, so just about half an hour. Uh, for our next session over here, uh, we're getting back into some research reports. Um, so we'll be splitting back out again into the breakout rooms to three different rooms. Uh, so breakout room one, one is Stephen Kahn uh, from Brock University. Breakout room two is Kanan uh, Gunas from Simon Fraser. Uh, and breakout room three is uh, Lynn McGarvey from the University of Alberta, Jennifer Thom from uh, U of Victoria, uh, Bryn Murkowski from U of A, and Nicole Wynham from University of Victoria. So uh, the rooms will be open uh, just about now. So once again, if anyone's having difficulty uh, getting into a specific room, uh, just, uh, just drop a line. Right. Welcome back. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, welcome back, everyone. Um, this is sort of a more informal part of our uh, our day. Uh, we invite you to carry, bring on, bring discussions back from your breakout rooms to start. Or uh, it's pretty informal, wouldn't you say, Joyce? Yes, yes. Um, and maybe we let's just take a a moment here to to thank all our presenters today. Um, thank you, um, Al, thank you, Nick, our invited uh, presenters. Ooh, am, can you still hear me? Yes, I just, yeah, <laughs> something happened with my computer. So thank you, Nick, thank you, Al, for your presentation. And thank you, everybody who presented the research reports, the posters, the short oral. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. You made this day. Thank, thank you. you so, yeah. I get yeah, so, so nervous, but we're, we couldn't have done it without all of you. You know, we were so excited during, especially nowadays, you know, we appreciate that this is an added volunteer <laughs> event uh, uh, to your schedules. And uh, it's, it's been such a rich day. Uh, thank you all very much. And we're glad that Alf is here. I'm not sure if Nick is still here. Um, so if you have anything, a comment that you forgot to ask, uh, you know, this is the time. Thank you uh, for coming back. I know you have a double duty today. <laughs> yes, Nick is here. here. Nick is here. So um, anything you learned from the uh, research reports, the posters that stood out for you today, here's the moment. And you can do this in two ways as well. You can write on the chat or you can uh, indicate by the hand and then we, we will. Um, yeah, I see. Um, hand there. Go ahead. Uh, Carla, can you see the hand? I can. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, we see you. Thank you. Yep, I got you. Hi, sorry. It's, it's a bit difficult for me to write on the chat. So, uh... So a lot of great topics and it was very difficult to choose a breakout room indeed. And I noticed that a lot of uh, these topics that were presented is really uh, related to the, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, and particularly number four. Number four is the, uh, uh, is the quality education and no one should be left behind. And, I wonder, so currently I'm working uh, with somehow Penn University level in my current institutions to bring these uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, as it was actually uh, revised in 2015 by the United Nations, uh, in case you are not familiar with. So we, we try to bring this uh, into uh, curriculums. And again, uh, so while I was researching for this, focusing on mathematics, it's very difficult to actually find uh, communities, mathematical communities. So it's 
like I see a lot of great efforts and work, uh, which is really about educating uh, our uh, students, uh, the new generations, and about the equity, equity and EDI uh, perspective as well. However, it's very difficult to find uh, this, this uh, central movement coming from mathematics, and maybe because I'm a new to this era, so I will, I'm, I'm having a hard time to see Chuck what has been done and what is going going in. So I, what I found is in 2013, there was MP uh, Mathematics for Planet Earth, and there was the huge activities uh, during 2013. And since that is stopped after that, or at least uh, uh, web, websites were all uh, split. Uh. So my question is, uh, uh, I'm asking uh, if, if there's any good information, uh, do we have some central uh, movement for uh, for these like for uh, SDGs at least for number four, um, or is it just because you are not aware of this this acronyms SDG number four? Oh, so should we actually have to uh, initiate as such communities so we actually collect all all these great great efforts? Right. Uh, first of all, Alf. What you have done is exactly what the the these the SDG number four is about, and we really want to raise the voice from mathematics as well. Again, we all agree that mathematics education is actually someone said it's a gateway, isn't it? I mean, for some country, mathematics is directly to, uh, related to their future. Unfortunately, I'm mean, somehow right. Sadly, so for 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 SDGs, it's really about sustainability and how we provide quality education for everyone in the on the earth. And so, do we have something in mathematics? Or so I believe you are somehow the like experts and leaders in this community. So that's my question. Sorry, I had a long introduction. Thank you, Jesse, and everybody can pitch in and, and talk, but after you want to say something. <laughs> sure. I, well, thank, thank you for the question, Jesse. It seems a really important question you're raising, and, and I would be really interested to hear of the 50 people here, whether people feel that there, there is some kind of central place where this work is happening, because I, I don't know of it. Um, a, 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 a group of people that like actually the pretty much the group I had on my first slide, we actually put a proposal to ICMI, the International Commission on Mathematical Instruction, for a study conference around kind of socio-ecological issues. Um, and ICMI were, were very positive. They, they, they said no, and they've gone with a different one, but they have encouraged us to hold a symposium this year, um, thinking about socio-ecological issues in mass education. So, so I guess that would be one place where we're hoping that there'll be a gathering of people interested in sustainable development goals and broader issues around um, ecology and, and maths education. Uh, but, but I think you're right, Jesse, I think that there, there is a need for some structure or, 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 or some, some way of bringing, bringing together this work. I, I'm, I'm with you. Thank you so much. At least knowing that it's really helping me uh, what to do, what should be the perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Joy. Sorry, we're all muted, so it takes me a sec to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kara, can, can you take over? Because I think my computer is really. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> 